Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Fairmont Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we're so glad that you're here. We're recording and sending it out all the way from Lodi, California, with Northern California. And this coming next 13 Sabbaths, we're going to be talking about this education. We're going to talk about this, this, uh, this you know, how God teaches us. There are, there are things such as the family, the law as a teacher. It's very, very exciting, the Sabbath. It's got a lot of material that we need to cover. However, before we start our journey into education, into the first lesson study, why don't we have, the God, have God bless us? So why don't we have a prayer? Father God, we come before your presence today. We want to thank you for all the many blessings you give us. We want to thank you, Lord, because you have taught us so many things. You've been kind. You've been gracious. You've been full of mercy. You've been compassionate. You've been loving. Thank you for your grace and mercy. And as we study this lesson, Lord, open up our eyes and our ears that we may see the glimpses of truth that you want us to see. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. Education. As we look about education, we come to the first lesson, lesson study one, education in the Garden of Eden. And look at the memory text. Behold, God is exalted by his power. Who teaches like him? Isn't that amazing? Job writes, who teaches us like God? But see, whenever you talk about teaching, you've got to talk about three people. See, my dad was a teacher. My mother was a teacher. And my sisters were teachers. You've got to talk about a teacher. Classroom has got three people. There's a teacher. There's also the student, right? We got to know the cal- you got to know the, the character of all these people. There's a teacher, there's a student, there is also the disruptor, that kid who sits in the back seat and throws spitwads at the teacher. And he always points his finger to somebody else other than him. So you got to know the whole psyche of the classroom if you're going to be a teacher or a student. So let's talk about the teacher first. Teacher number one, you find that in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, there's no ifs and buts as, as Moses writes Genesis, Genesis and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. As he writes these first five books, he does not take any prisoners. He says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. God is our creator. Just how God accomplished the work of creation in six literal days, he has never revealed to mortals. His creative works, she goes on to say, his creative works are just as incomprehensible as his existence. In other words, if you can figure out, if you can figure out how God created, you could prove his existence. And I like what Max Lucado says over here. He says, you weren't an accident. You weren't even mass-produced in an assembly line. You were deliberately planned, specifically gifted, and lovingly positioned on the earth by the master, crea- master craftsman. You see, I would like to think of myself like that. I don't want somebody telling me that I came from a monkey. No, I want God to say, you know what? I knit you together in your mother's womb. Before you were created, I knew you. I love this. And the Holy Spirit... Was the Holy Spirit involved? Yes, of course. Look what it says in Genesis 1 and 2. Moses goes on. Look, he says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering like a butterfly over the waters. Isn't that amazing? The Spirit of God was looking over. And he says, hmm, this is very interesting. Let's see what we can do here. And was Jesus involved in creation? Look what it says over here. In John 1, 1, John 1 and 3, in Arche and Hologos, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, referencing back to Genesis 1, 1. Through Him, all things were made. So you find that the, that the three units of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, were involved in creation. So we got to look at the collective attributes of the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Ghost, because that helps us quite a bit to know how God is. First of all, we find that God is love, is He not? You find that in 1 John 4, 7 and 8, whoever does not love God does not know God, because God is what? He is love. And the Greek word is agape estentios. God is love. Not only is God love, He's also compassionate, is He not? As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. And we talked about this, 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 this word compassion a few uh, Sabbaths ago where the compassion is this, this plank nose, this, this feeling sick to the stomach. When God sees us, He sees how frail we are. Psalm 103 and 14, it says, He as a father has compassion, so the Lord has compassion. Not only is God compassionate, He's also a provider, is He not? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, Psalm 103, 2 and 5, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You know, as you get, as you get older, you want to be strong, you want to run a few miles, and you want to exercise. And you look at all the kids beside you just doing the, you know, doing things that begin to take you a little bit longer. However, God says, you know what, He satisfies your, you, your life with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Not only this, is God our provider, God is a consuming fire. Here's where we lose a number of us. Let us be thankful. So worship God. Acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. This aspect of a consuming fire of a God is kind of difficult for us to understand. So let's look at this. These four things. God, number one, is love, is he not? Number two, God is our compassion. God is very compassionate. And God is our provider. And God is a consuming fire. You find all these four attributes of God. And it's, we cannot stop at the attributes of the teacher, God. We have to go into the attributes of the student. Who are the students? that are listening to what God is trying to teach us. You see, my friends, this is very important because you cannot go into a, into a biology class and start teaching Shakespeare, right? Because the students are geared for biology, and you start with, your, with, with, with Tempest, uh, or, you know, or Much Ado About Nothing, or you, you, the, the Timmy of the Shrew, or Romeo and Juliet, they're not going to quite understand, Right? So we have to understand the, the students, what they are capable of doing. Students, we are a group of defiant people because God seems to violate our freedom to choose. Look what it says, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses. They are a stiff-necked people. They are just set on their own ways. They're not, they can't, they don't, their neck is not a rubber. They're not rubbernecking. They are strict, they are straight, and we are defined. It's my way, God, or no other way. God, only say, God says you're not even defined. You're also disobedient. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, he says. Why? And you just do your own thing. You don't do what I tell you, so why am I a Lord to you? We are disobedient people. Not only are we disobedient, we are mutinous people. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Titus 1.16. Not only are we mutinous, we are wayward people, are we not? I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Isaiah 1, 3. You see, we don't have, that's not too much of us. I mean, it's not, it's not good things for us is that we're defiant. We're disobedient people. We are mutinous. <laughs> is there hope for me? Is there hope for me? I'm defiant. I'm disobedient. I'm mutinous. I'm wayward. Well, we can't stop at that, can we? When you talk about the education, talk about the teacher who's full of love and compassion and is a provider. We also talk about the students who are, who are pretty much defined with everything. We got to talk about who the disruptor in the classroom is. The disruptor's char characters, four major characters. Number one, he's cruel. He's like a roaring lion. It's, he pretty much says, if I can't have heaven, neither can you. And so he's going, going to go to extreme measures and try to destroy you. That's a specialty. He's cruel. He doesn't care what happens to you. He's a disruptor. 
Not only that, he's deceitful. He tries to deceive the whole world. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who deceives the entire cosmos, the entire world. And was, he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Revelation 12 and verse 9. Not only is he deceitful, he's unseen. You see, we can't see these things. And Paul, writing to the Ephesians in, verse, in chapter 6 and verse 12, he says, Listen, our struggle is not against flesh. If we see something, we can fight it. But this is against all the rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, we can't see this guy. We can't see Satan. And so he manifests himself in different ways. And Paul just writes, you know what? We got to do something about this. Of course, the final one, he's the accuser. Then he heard a loud voice in heaven, once again in Revelation 12, verse 10. And now have come the salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser. You see, my friends, this Satan, he stands in the assembly of God. And he cannot say one good thing about you and me. He's watched us. When we're sleeping, he's, pre he's, he's figuring out how to trap us. And then when we fail, he takes it right to the heavenly throne, goes up to God and says, look, you want this guy? You want this loser in heaven? And you don't want me in heaven? Accuser of our brothers and sisters. So you find that he is cruel. He is deceitful. Oh, he is unseen. And he is the accuser. Stands in the presence of God and points his bony fingers at you and me, and he says, If I cannot have heaven, God, look at this guy, look at this loser. You can't take him to heaven. So we find here all these things, right? Now, what is the relationship between, between the student and the disruptor? Is there some way that we can we can bypass this? Look on, look at what, what Paul says in Ephesians 6:11. Yeah, we can't see him, but you know what? We need to put on the armor of God. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So Paul admonishes, he tells us, you know what? If you want to fight against spiritual realms, if you want to take this guy on, you know what you got to do? You got to put on the armor of God. Armor of God. You got to have the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, the, the loin of truth. You got to have the feet clad with the gospel of good news. You've got to have all this stuff. Plus, you need to have Jesus himself. You see, thus you can fight. Well, how is our relationship between the teacher and the student? Look what he says over here. The, the, the teacher and the student, God says, you know what? You will hear a voice on the right. And you follow it. I am with you all the ways. So what are the biblical examples of, of a teaching God? Has God taught people in the Bible? Bible is full of examples where God goes in and starts to teach people. Look what he does to, jo to Job. Job. You know what Job's problem was? He was self-sufficient, was he not? He had everything going for him. Kids, family, retirement, goats, sheep, camels, you name it. He got it. He was only he was the richest man. Bible says richest man in the middle, in the east. And God says, Wait. I got to learn to teach you trust. And so you find in Job 13, verse 15, 13 chapters later, Job comes along and says, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. You see, if God can have that kind of people in heaven, heaven will be a wonderful place. It doesn't stop there. Look at our friend Abraham. He was also self-sufficient, was he not? He was living a very nice life. He was a rich um, businessman in the, in the east, land of Ur. He was a good guy. He had, he had everything going for him. He was old. He was getting ready for retirement. For he was looking. And then God, say, one, say, tell, one day he tells him in Genesis chapter 15, he says, Hey, you know what, Abraham? I'm going to make a covenant with you. You're going to be a father of nations. You're going to be a father of three huge religions right now. Is he not? Christianity. Islam and Judaism all trace their, 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 their fatherhood to Abraham. And God says, you know, Abraham, I got to teach you faith. When you have all these things, you don't need me. 
but I'm going to teach you faith. I want you to go. I want you to take your entire family. I don't know why it says that a, a thousand people followed, followed Abraham, all of his servants. And they followed him. He didn't even have any kids for crying out loud. He only had Lot. His nephew. And so what does he say? God tells Abraham. He says, Abraham, I want you to keep traveling until I tell you when to stop. And Abraham says, God, are you kidding me? But because you say so, I will do it. Abraham was faith. How about Moses? Moses was in the Pharaoh's court for many years, was he not? He was groomed to be the next Pharaoh. He had everything going for him. And God takes him out. And he says, you're going to learn to sheep. You're going to learn to be a shepherd. And he says in Psalm 90, verse 14, this is one of the chapters, one of the, one of the chapters of Psalms that Moses has penned. It is, it, it is, it is given, it is, it is authored by Psalm, by, by, by Moses. He says, Satisfy us in the morning with the unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad our day's confidence. Here was a guy that's out there and God gives him confidence. And he teaches him in the desert how to lead people. And look at Joshua. Joshua was, was self-sufficient, was he not? He's traveled. He's been with, with, with Moses for many years. He was Moses' right hand. But God says, wait. As Moses dies and as Joshua is entering to the promised land, he's got Ai, Jericho, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, all these ites that he's got to wipe out before he gets to the promised land. God says, wait, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land. I swore to you their ancestors to give you. How about Naaman, the leper warrior? He was self-sufficient, was he not? He had everything going for him, right? But God says, wait, Naaman. Look what it says. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely, talking about Elisha, surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord at his hand and wave his hand over my spot and then cure me of my leprosy. But no, God says, you know what? I'm going to teach you humility. You're not going to go to the waters of Syria. You're going to go to the waters, this muddy Jordan, and you're going to dunk in there seven times. Very interesting. And then you have Lot. How about Lot? Lot, when he hesitated, the men grasped his hand. I love this text because there are times when God tells us to leave a place that we don't leave. And guess what he does? If you're close to God, God says that God comes and drags your hand and he pulls you out of that thing and in the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city for the Lord was merciful to them. Providence, providence. Yes, and finally we have Saul, who becomes a Paul. He's self-sufficient. He was on the right track. He thought he was. He studied everything, and he was going to snuff out the Christians, the early Christians. But God said, wait, I got something else for you in mind. I'm going to redirect all the energy you're going this way. I'm going to redirect them that way. Instead of you being a persecutor of Christians, you are going to write for me two-thirds of the New Testament. You're going to write for me those, those powerful um, letters from Rome's Mamertine dungeon. You're going to write those powerful uh, prison episodes. You're going to talk about, you're going to write letters to Corinthians. You're going to write letters to, the, to Ephesians. You're going to write letters to Galatians, the Philippians. You, you're going to write all these beautiful, beautiful, powerful books. I'm going to redirect your energy. How does God teach us today? What is our self-sufficiency? And what is God going to teach us today? That is what we're going to study about today. You see, my friends, we are a group of self-sufficient people. We can do everything we want, right? Everything is going our way. But we think we can get to heaven on our own. So my question for you is, why should I repent? Because repentance is what God is asking for. Why should we repent? You see, we have these checkmark religion, don't we? It's a, check, it's a checklist religion. You got the Ten Commandments, no other gods, no graven image. Don't take the name of God. We don't. 
Don't remember the Sabbath day. Oh, oh, yeah, we do. Honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Steal. False witness. Covet. We have a checklist religion. And what happens with us is that I must be okay. We're good people. Seventh-day Adventists by nature are good people. Did you know that? Tap your sh- your, yourself on the shoulder just a little bit. You don't drink. You don't smoke. You don't eat pork. You give tithe. You keep God's commandments. I mean, come on, face it. Heaven should be full of people like me. You see, one thing I forgot is that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone only. The Ten Commandments, I must be okay. We're good people. And we often say this, you know, heaven should be filled with people like me. Seriously? Yet we don't know how to pray. We don't know what repentance is. We don't know what obedience is. And at times, we don't know who Jesus is. We're not like them. Revelation 3, 16 and 19, talking about the Laodicean church. Jesus says, you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. Therefore, he gives this word, metanoia, repent. Repentance. Repentance is, is, the, is, 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 is a beautiful, powerful word. But whenever you look at repentance, you got to look at sin. And look at this. What a wretched man that I am here. He is writing. Paul is writing this. Paul who saw Jesus on the way. And he says, the, what a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Because you know why? That which I want to do, I don't do. That which I, that which I should be doing, I don't do. What I, what, that which I don't want to do, I keep doing it. That conflict is there. And then he writes on in this beautiful summation in Romans 8, chapter 1. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are where? In Christ Jesus. Can we say amen to that? You see, my friends, once Jesus steps into your life, something happens. Something happens. Sin takes off and repentance is born. Steps to Christ, that little book. I just saw one lying around here. Steps to Christ, she says, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes, for your vision will be clearer. And your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. In other words, Jesus doesn't come to just clean the house. He comes to clean the closet as well. And she goes on to say this, this, this beautiful statement. She says, all that man can do without Christ is polluted with selfishness and sin. It is the grace of Christ alone through faith that can make us holy. See, keeping the laws, one, two, three, four, five, and doing things and doing this and not doing that is not going to get us to heaven. Jesus is going to get us to heaven. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And once as you focus on Jesus... What happens is that your life begins to do things that you're never aware that you could do. Jesus takes front seat and everything else becomes a secondary item. When that happens, she says, when that happens, your salvation is secure. You see, repentance has two arms to it. Number one is coming to God, and number two is staying with God. We like the first aspect of it, coming to God. That's good. We like repentance. We like that first part. But staying with God is a problem for us. What is coming to God? That is justification. It's a past life. We like that. We come, and somebody preaches a good sermon. Then we get all teary-eyed. We kneel down. We give our lives to Jesus. That is justification. But... The next word, sanctification, becomes a problem in our lives. We just, we go back. We go back. Why? Because there's that pull between God and Satan. There's a constant pull, the tug of war. And there are times when we fall. There are times when Satan pulls us. And there are times when God pulls us back. And this constant jostling between good and evil at times can be very tiring. So what is the role of the Holy Spirit in repentance? 
Or does, does the Holy Spirit play any, any role in repentance at all? Or is it just all my head knowledge? Look what, uh, once again, the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts and causes repentance. And he does three things. He justifies us. He also sanctifies us, makes us holy. And he also seals us. You see, my friends, without the presence of the Holy Spirit actively acting in your life and in my life, we're just a bunch of noisy people. First Corinthians 13. Well, these are ages. She says here, sin could be resisted and overcome. And here's that word, only. Only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. But yet, how little we know about the Holy Spirit. We don't. There are people writing theses against the Holy Spirit. We're having, we're having people disagreeing when it comes to an argument about the Holy Spirit. There seems to be almost a fight. And look what she goes on to say. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of God. Amos 8. This is right before Joel, right? And look what, else, look what else happens. There's a spiritual drought that is happening, that is coming in our, own, in our own lives. Just look around us. We are in the end times. You look at all the stuff. Joel 2 is coming into play, and then we have John 16, and then you have, you have, you have uh, uh, all, these, all these times of the end. You look at Matthew 28. And you find that Jesus is telling us time is very short. We're living in the last days. We're living in the last days. And you know, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Joel 2, 28. This is downtown Los Angeles. But right before Colosseum. When God pours out his spirit upon all of us. Look how people are traveling. They're traveling like as though they have all life, all day, all ever. There are people that don't even care, painting our house and making your, your, your retirement secure. And God takes a back seat. But God says, wait, I don't want that because in the last days, Joel 2, 28, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. The spirit and the power of God, great controversy, 464. The spirit and the power of God will be poured out upon his children, will be poured. Are you ready to receive the Holy Spirit? Or like she says, the Holy Spirit will be falling on all parts on, all, around all of us, but we won't be able to recognize it. It's a desperate message for a desperate time. And we have here a warning given in Acts of the Apostles, page 50, verse, page 50 and for the first chapter. Wherever the need of the Holy Spirit is a matter little thought of, there is seen a spiritual drought, a spiritual darkness, a spiritual declension, and finally death. How is your church today? In other words, how is your life today? Forget the church. Because the church is made up of people like you and me. If we are on fire, the church is on fire. Don't blame the church. Don't blame the building and say, oh, there's nobody there. No, how is your secret life? How is your life with God? How is your walk with Jesus? Is it filled with the Holy Spirit? If there's 10 people like you walking there who's filled with the Holy Spirit, your church will be on fire. She also says... In Acts of the Apostles, the next page, she says, Why do we not talk about, talk of it, it meaning the Holy Spirit? Pray for it. Preach concerning it. The Lord is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who serve Him than parents are to give good gifts for their children. When was the last time you heard a good sermon on the Holy Spirit? My friends, John 16 verse 8 says this. When He comes... He will prove the world to be in the, wrong, in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. You see, when we put the Holy Spirit on the back burner, these things cannot happen. And most of us are guilty of that. Signs of the Times in 1883, she, it's exact, it, it, exact uh, writing. She says this, the Holy Spirit exalts and glorifies the Savior. It is to His office. It is His office to present Christ Tell me how you're get to, going to get to know about Christ if you don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit points, I will send you the Comforter. 
right? And he will lead you into all truth. Go to the upper room, wait for me over there. And on the day of Pentecost, I will be giving you something very special. That is where Joel 2 comes along and he says, wait a minute, Acts 2 and Joel 2 and John 16, they're all sister chapters. And, Acts, uh, and Joel 2 comes along and says, in the last days, guess what? You're in the upper room. You're praying. And God says, I will pour out my spirit upon you. Because I need people. I need people because I'm coming soon. The Holy Spirit is Jesus' successor on earth. White, she says, February 18, 1895, letter 119. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. Period. These are pages 671. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life, you cannot overcome sin. I'm not telling that. She is writing it. And it makes sense. It could only be resisted and overcome. Two-headed monster. Not only enough to resist, but you got to be able to overcome. That is justification and that is sanctification. They both are compiled together. They're, they're, they're commuted. They're, they're joined together by the bridge of the Holy Spirit. And look at this next text. It is through the impartation of the Holy Spirit that we are made to understand the Word of God. How can you even understand the Scriptures? When you read the scriptures, that is why, my friends, when you read the scriptures, when you open up the Bible, open it up and say, Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit, send your spirit upon us so that I'm able to understand. You know, last night I couldn't sleep. I was looking at 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, would pray, would seek, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will heal the land and forgive their sins. You see, my friends, for Second Chronicles seven fourteen is very powerful. It's very powerful. But before we get to that, here it is again. God has provided divine assistance for all the emergencies. How many? All the emergencies to which our human resources are unequal. He gives the Holy Spirit help in every strait. To strengthen our hope and assurance, to illuminate our minds and purify our hearts. Do I need the Holy Spirit in my life? Absolutely. Do you need it? Yes, you do. Because you cannot go through life and face all its emergencies, all those, those curveballs that Satan is point, point, throwing at you without the Holy Spirit, without the sword of the Spirit. You can't. Without that armor of God, you can't. Without the Holy Spirit right beside you, you can't. You are a dead man walking. We are defenseless. We are defenseless. We are defenseless without the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, we march into life thinking life is going to be okay. Life is not going to be okay. You know why? While you were sleeping, the destroyer, the disruptor, Satan himself was making out the plan for you next day. And he has sent his minions out to destroy you. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in front of you, beside you, around you, surrounding you with a wall of fire and a wall of, a wall of thorns and a, and, and, and a wall of flame of fire and a wall of bricks, wall of stone. Once again, you're a dead man walking. We are defenseless without the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, my friends, we talk about the teacher. We talk about the student. We talk about the disruptor. In education, there's all these three people. What is God trying to teach us in the last days? Have you wondered? What is God, in His mighty wisdom, what is God trying to teach us in the last days? Behold, He says, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. Revelation twenty two twelve. 12. And then here is that text, my favorite text. It's up right over here in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their lands. So you see, it is God's people, my people. We always think of repentance is that guy that is underneath that, that, that overpass, the homeless guy who's just stoned and who's drunk and who's got so many problems. He needs to repent and come to church. But what happens to us who are inside the church? God says, if my people who are called by my name, 
He puts out His word, His people, those, those who are baptized by His name. The, the, the repentance is for God's people because we have been self-sufficient. He says, humble yourself. Pray. This word pray is not tefillah. It's a falal. It, 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 it means to intercede. And then seek as something that is lost. And then shuv. Here's that word shuv. Turn Hebrew. It says shuv. If you turn, then, here's the word, and even now declares the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Turn to the Lord your God, and for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in mercy, in love. Joel 2. You see, my friends, this is repentance. Are you hurting this much? Are you rending your heart with fasting? Are you rending your heart fasting and weeping and mourning and are you when was the last time you prayed like this i don't even remember when i prayed like this but see i'm okay i go to church i'm a leader in the church i went to a seminary i'm good heaven should be full of people like this and god says you hypocrite i don't need you in heaven i need someone who loves jesus in heaven you see, it's a double turn. First you turn from sin, and then you turn to God. It's a double turn. This, this word shuv in Hebrew, it's a double turn. It's not a single turn. That's why you find multiple times this word is used twice. And one of these days we'll talk about the, this, the, this, 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 this word. See, you should have an upward trajectory. Yes, you will go through life, follow that red line. You'll have a beautiful life, up, up line, and then all of a sudden it plateaus out. And then, boom, something happens, and down you go. And then you come back again, flat, come back again. But see, always you are you're pursuing the goal heavenwards, upwards. And as you get closer and closer to heaven, guess what happens? You fall less and less and less. Because as you get closer to God, closer to Jesus, you see the sinfulness of sin. And you don't want to hurt him. It doesn't become a checklist religion. It becomes a religion of the heart. He says, in the last days, I will write my laws upon their hearts. And I will love them. Jeremiah. Repentance. That's what repentance is. And Ravi Zacharias, the late Ravi Zacharias, puts it this way. Only through repentance and faith in Christ can anyone be saved. No religious activity will be sufficient. Only true faith in Jesus. Christ alone. That is the only thing. You see, repentance is both. It's coming to God and staying with God. It is coming to God, which is justification, and staying with God, which is sanctification. Each day, testimony, TT 251, she says this, each day he must renew his conscious consecration. My friends, I just want to tell you something. As I prepare this, this is more a lesson for me than for you. Because, see, I don't do these things. I'm guilty just as much as you are. But each day he must renew his consecration. Old habits, hereditary tendencies to wrong will strive for the master. And against these, he is to strive. In whose strength? Not in your strength. You can't, you can't do it. It's in Christ's strength. That is repentance. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Isaiah 1, 18. Though your sins are like scarlet, shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Repentance is for my people, those who are called by my name. If we clean house from within, our churches will be on fire. Instead, we look at others and say, oh, we have to have this program, that program, the other program. No, no, no. Have the program for yourself. Cleanse your heart and let Jesus come through. You see, Isaiah 59, 2, we come to the last two slides. But your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. He just can't hear. Come now, come now. Let us return to the Lord. And as you return, this is the promise that I want you to go with, Ezekiel 36, 26. 
I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. See, my friend, that is repentance. You see, when you put faces to repentance, it becomes an actual happening. My people call by name. You can take the stick and you can take that person's picture and put your picture there. If my people who are called by name, if they repent. You see, God is a loving God. He wants us to be repenting. He wants us to have a relationship with us. But see, our sins have put barriers. And some of them are so strong. Our barriers are so strong. It is just difficult for us to open and come out. And God says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about all this theological stuff, mishmash. It's kind of hard for you to understand. Just focus on Jesus. Read the book of John. The book of John is all about Jesus. Tell me one thing that Jesus did wrong. He loved us so much, did he not? And that to me, my friends, is repentance. So our first lesson study is over. Next week we'll study more as we travel through the Bible. I travel through the Bible and through our education book. And may God continue to bless us. And let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, Heavenly Father, we come before your presence. You are a loving God. You're awesome. You're beautiful. You're our creator, deliverer. Our everlasting, eternal Father, you are the glorious King. Lord, you are loving. You are immortal. You are just, kind. You are merciful. You are never ending. You are omnipotent. You are powerful. You are quick to answer our prayers, Lord. We'd be lost without you. You're our Redeemer, Savior, true friend, underneath victorious, wonderful Jehovah, Jireh, our provider. Lord, we come to you today. We want you to wash us. We want you to purify us. We, we want you, Lord, in our hearts, and we want to repent, Father. We want your Holy Spirit among us. We want you to wash us, cleanse us. We want you to justify us and sanctify. And Lord, come into our heart today. May the Sabbath day be a wonderful lesson study for us. And may your Sabbath day be filled with you in our midst. Thank you so much for all that you do for us. We pray in your most holy name. Amen. Thank you, my friends. Have a wonderful day today. And go read Joel too. Thank you. Bye-bye.